Hello, fifth grade champions. Uh, today we are continuing our reading of Falcon Wild. I'm really excited about this book. I'm really enjoying this book and I'm um, not really sure where we're headed uh, with this story, but at least she's no longer uh, down in a crevice pit with a skeleton where she can't get out, uh, even though she is with Cooper. Uh, at least she's not uh, left alone there uh, forever. So we're on page 69, chapter 12. We slide to the bottom of the slope, but my eyes scan upward to the sky. Give me the laces on your shoes, I say as I shrug off my pack and drop it beside me. To make what I need, I'll have to sacrifice a sock. Maybe I can fill it with dirt. I'm not giving you my laces. What do you need laces for anyway? Maybe I can use tape to tie it together, I say, opening my pack. Did I bring tape? I glance at Cooper. I need to make, wait, what am I going to use as a tidbit? Make what? What's a tidbit? I growl and dig deeper in the pack. Maybe we can trap a mouse or something. My hand closes around a familiar duck-shaped object. Ah, my lure. I had originally packed it back home with a quail leg and a Ziploc baggie to fly start but that was in my falconry satchel. My, my brother must have put this in my backpack. Thank you, Gavin. I tie the tidbit to the lure and then search the sky. I need to get my bird before I do anything. I whistle and swing the lure as far as I can so Stark can see it. She was with me this morning and I hope she hasn't given up on me yet. Suddenly, a shadow passes over me. Stark snatches the lure and I almost cry out in relief. I reach her on the ground and pick her up, along with a bit of meat and bone. The weight of her hurts my wound, but the fact that she's with me makes me feel lighter. I smile and croon to her, but she'll have none of it. She mantles over her prize, hiding it from me before choking it down. She hasn't mantled with me since the first weeks. She makes small noises, irritated pips, and then glares at Cooper. Whoa, Cooper says, she's hungry. I say as we walk. She's asking, where's the meat? Cooper lets out a muffled laugh. I know how she feels. After a few minutes of walking, Cooper asks, why doesn't she just hunt something? She's an imprinted bird and she was trained poorly. She's used to people and lures and being fed. When a bird is trained to the lure too much, that's all they want. But some birds are trained to hunt with people. That's called falconry. Right now, I help with education demonstrations at our center. But as an apprentice falconer next year, I'll learn the magic of hunting with a wild animal when the bird accepts you as a partner. Well, if she can't hunt, what good is she? I recoil. It's not her fault she can't hunt. Besides, she was doing something important at our center. She was teaching all kinds of people about falcons and making them fall in love with her. Cooper makes a gagging sound, ending the discussion. We walk in silence. After a while, I realize how thirsty I still am. I lick my lips and look around. Why didn't you bring any water, I ask. I wasn't planning on following a bird this far, or being stuck out here without a bike. How much farther to that highway? We must have walked a mile by now. I point to the forest at the base of the mountain. We should head in there. We're moving west and the forest runs east-west along the side of the open prairie. We can look for water on our way. Once we step into the trees, the cooler air is a relief. The smell of it brings me back to early season hunts with Aunt Amy and Tank. Gavin and I would be dogging, running through the alders to scare out hares for the bird. I wish we were home. And eight feels me. I wish we were home. Shaking my head, I just stark on my fist. She's getting heavy. We hike over soft needles and crunchy pine cones. Squirrels chitter at us. We're surrounded by lush pines between the mountain, the forest, and the prairie. I think dad would like to do an outdoor classroom lessons in this area. When I think about dad, a sickening dread fills me. I'm thirsty, so are they. Three days. That's as long as anyone can live without water. I left them yesterday, so the clock started then. 
Gavin would have finished the water they had by now. I need to find that highway. Where is it? My throat burns. I lick my lips again. Where would we find water, you think? Cooper asked. I dig into my pack, I say as I turn back to him. I've got some gummies. I stand still as Cooper rummages through my pack. I'm not sure why it feels so personal with him in my pack while it's on my back, but I didn't want to move start from my fist. I'm afraid she'll leave. Cooper pulls out the Ziploc bag, but doesn't give it to me when I hold out my hand for it. He empties it into his own hand. I have time to see there are only five left in the bag before he grabs them and tosses them into his mouth. I'm just about to kick him in the shin when he hands me the ones he saved. Three gummies tumble into my palm. We need a creek or something, Cooper says. I nod. I suck my gummies slowly as we continue. The sugar rush helps keep my feet moving, but too soon my stops are sluggish. My thirst soars in my head. My empty stomach growls. I feel hollowed out. I'm painfully aware I haven't eaten a real meal since yesterday morning. <clears throat> was it only yesterday that I was at home eating flax pancakes? It feels like a lifetime ago. My arm throbs with the effort of carrying Stark. I'm about to call a break when Cooper slows down and then sits on a log. With relief, I transfer Stark to a stump and swing my arm around. Out of the corner of my eye, I watch Cooper pull out the thing he's been hiding in his jacket. I sit down beside him and he immediately moves further away. What is that, I ask. He holds something in his hands. As he shuffles, trying to hide whatever it is he's got, loose papers flutter onto the ground between us. Cooper scoots them up, but not before I recognize what it is. Where did you get that money? Cooper narrows his eyes at me and then sho shoves the bills into his pocket, tossing a decaying wallet on the ground. I found it. It's mine. You stole it. Cooper stands. That pile of bones wasn't using it anymore. Think of it as payment for risking my life for you. When I study him, he squirms under my gaze. What? The dangerously low way Cooper says this sends a cold prickle across my neck. I wonder how safe I really am with him. Maybe I'd be better off by myself. I don't care about your money, all right? I just need to get help for my family. We should keep going. Cooper gestures for me to lead the way. I take up Stark again, ignoring the pain, and we plod along the edge of the forest without looking at each other. I keep peering ahead uneasily. There's still no sign of a highway or road or even a trail. We should have been there by now. As we walk, I can't handle the silence. How much money is that, I ask? I knew it. Money is all anyone cares about, including you. You're looking for a bribe, aren't you? Fine. How much to keep you quiet about it? I keep walking calmly. I wasn't thinking about it, that at all. Just I wonder how no one found him. When did he fall into the crevice? Why didn't anyone look for him? It's a mystery, don't you think? What do I care? Cooper trips on a root while trying to keep pace with me and curses. And I wonder why the wallet and money didn't decompose, but the body did, I say. In open air, the body would only take like a year, Cooper says, but the money was protected in the wallet. It's really not that big a mystery. With an uneasy feeling, I study him out of the corner of my eye. Why does he know how long a body takes to decompose? The pines here block out the sun. When we get close to the edge of the forest, I see where the sun is, and it's much lower than I thought. We've been walking ever since Cooper got me out of the crevice. As we hike, a subtle sound breaks through my thoughts. Stop. I hold out a hand. Do you hear that? We look at each other, strained to listen over the wind through the trees. Water! We both turn and race toward the sound. I think it's coming from our right, but Cooper runs to the left. I crash through a large clump of willows. When I emerge on the other side, I'm beside a nearly dried up stream. The water gurgles over rocks and collects in a little pool. Cooper, over here! I hope Stark will have a bath, but she ignores the water after hopping off my fist. We both plunge our cupped hands in and pull up handfuls of delicious cool water. It is sweet and glorious. I'm a sponge with all my nooks and crannies filling out. If I drink enough, maybe it will fill the emptiness in my belly, but the water only makes me hungrier. Does the bird drink, Cooper asks? They get water from meat, but they usually love to bathe if they're, 
if they feel like they're in a safe environment. I sit back and wipe my mouth. Water soaks the top of my hoodie and the bottoms of my sleeves. The filthy bandage on my arm is soaked too and is sticking to my skin, but I'm afraid to mess with it. I don't want to look at it just now. We sit for a moment, absorbing the water. My mouth finally feels normal. Reaching into my waistband at the small of my back, I pull out the empty water bottle and fill it. I wish we had another bottle to carry the water in. I don't know when we're going to find more. Then I remember the Ziploc bag the gummies were in. I pull it out and dip the bag into the water. When I zip it closed, it's like a square water balloon. I carefully hold it up to suspect for any holes, no leaks. This will work until we get to... I'm interrupted by a scream behind me. I whirl around in time to see Cooper do a little dance. His knees come up in a rapid succession while he looks down in horror. What? Snake, yeah, it's, it's just a snake snuck up on me. Cooper sniffs and flicks his hair out of his eyes. Once he has his cool again, he puts on an expression of indifference like a cloak. He picks up a stick and spreads the grasses with it, peering at the snake. We can eat that, he says. Yikes, watch it. That's a prairie rattlesnake, I say. It's late in the season for them to be out. So we can't eat it? They're venomous not poisonous, we can eat it as long as we don't let it bite us. Cooper picks up a rock and hurls it at the snake. It coils up, rattles, and slithers into a hole between some rocks. The speed it can move makes me want to lift both feet at the same time I watch from a distance. What's wrong? Cooper asks. You afraid of snakes? No, it's not that. It's just, well, yeah, I may be afraid of snakes. That sucks, Cooper says, peering into the place the snake disappeared. Feels like forever since I ate anything. With the water packed in my bag, I notice how much heavier it is and how much weaker I feel. We need to find something to eat, but even more than that, we need to find the highway. So we're gonna stop there. Chapter 13, we'll start that on Monday, page 77. Wow, they're on an adventure. Thanks so much, fifth grade students. Have a wonderful weekend. See you Monday. Take care of yourselves.